are going to hear a word from the Lord on today. Yes. Amen. Yes. I ask that you pray for our pastor. Amen. Pray for his strength. Pray for his wisdom. Pray for his guidance that he forever keeps his eyes on yes. the Lord. Yes. As he seeks him daily, moment by moment. Yes. Seek him for direction and leading and understanding that he will lead us people of God. Yes. Pray for him and, and encourage him when you get an opportunity. Amen. Pray for him, amen. Because he is. He needs it. Amen. He's praying for all of us, even though you know we don't hear him doing it. And he prays on 530 um morning, Wednesday morning. He's praying for all of us, those he knows and those he don't know. Thank you, Lord. He's praying for us in the community. He's praying for us in the city at large. Thank and I thank God for that. I thank God because we have a praying pastor, one that seeks God in everything that he does. Amen. And immediately following this election, I ask that you once again stand and give him reverence as a man of God, Amen. a shepherd of this house. Amen.
but holy God. You are a holy God. You are a righteous God. And you are a God, a great God. And they that worship you, we must worship you in spirit and in truth, O oh God. And so continue to inhabit the praises of your people. For there is a sweet, sweet presence, O oh God, in this place even right now. So let this word of God fall on good ground to run on and see what the end is going to be. And we'll be careful to give your name the glory and the honor and the praise. For us in Jesus' matchless and mighty name, we pray this day. Amen and amen. Amen. While you're standing, I like to read the scripture while you're standing in reverence to the word of God. Let us turn uh, together to Acts chapter 12. And we're going to read verses 1 through 5 and 11 through 16. It may be a familiar passage of scripture, but I want to bring this scripture to your attention on this day. Acts chapter 12, verse 1 through 5, and verses 11 through 16. If you're there, say amen. If you need some more time, say wait. No wait. And the word of God says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church and he killed James the brother of John with the sword and because he saw it pleased the Jews it pleased the people he proceeded further to take Peter also then were the days of unleavened bread and when he had apprehended him he put him talking about Peter in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers Quaternions are four sets of four. So he, he put him in the possession of 16 soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. All right, so they, the people of God were praying for Peter. We're going to skip down to verse 11. And it reads, and when Peter was come to himself, he said, now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Verse 12, and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So he decided to go to the house of God where the people of God were praying. Verse 13, and as people, as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened up the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And we're going to end on oh, no, verse 15. And they said unto her, thou art mad. But she constantly or consistently affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is an angel, or it is his angel. And we're going to end at verse 16. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were astonished. You may take your seats. I'm going to take my topic from uh, verse 13. I'm going to take my topic today from verse 13. Verse 13 reads again, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, and so I want to use for a topic today. It's at the door. Tell your neighbor, it's at the door. It's at the door. It's at the door. Whatever it is that you need, I'm here to declare today that it's at the door. It's already at the door. You just have to get to the door and open the door. Amen. It says in our scripture today that Peter came knocking at the door and a, a damsel hearkened unto the door. Uh, I'm not here to ridicule the young lady at the door, but when she understood and heard that it was Peter's voice, for some reason she did not open up the door. And so for your hearing, uh, I want to talk about today for a short moment, short time. It's at the door. It's, it's at the door. Um, some corresponding scriptures that you can use just to take note for you to read. I want you to write down John 14 and 6. Write down Proverbs 16 and 25. Um, Revelation 3 and 20. Uh, this 
John 14 and 6, Proverbs 16 and 25, Revelations 3 and 20. But there are some other scriptures that I can have. But in our scripture, uh, essential scripture today, it shows, I believe, the state of Christianity today. We have the form of godliness, but for some reason we deny the power thereof. We know how to dance and make a joyful noise unto the Lord, but every single service that we come, we, we appear to leave in the same state that we came in. We know how to speak in tongues and many unknown tongues, but for some reason we don't know how to speak to one another and love one another. We know how to lift up the name of Jesus, but for some reason we don't have the authority or the power over the enemy like we should, uh, understanding that at the name of Jesus, everything is subject to the name of Jesus. And not only do we not have power over the enemy, but we don't even have power over our own lives. And in this story today, the story of Peter uh, being released in prison, uh, there are certain events that occurred uh, at the door. And these certain events highlighted the fact that the early church or the early Christians of this day did not understand or completely understand the power that they really had. They didn't understand the power uh, that they had comes from trusting in a non-failing God. They didn't understand that the power uh, that they had access to comes uh, through uh, effectual and fervent prayer. James would later write in a scripture because um, in this scripture it says James, uh, uh, the house that they went to was uh, James, a uh, uh, mother to Mary of John and, and Mark. And it was James, the brother of John, that was killed. Um, but before this time, James would write uh, in his epistle, confess your faults one to another. And pray for one another that ye may be healed. And oftentimes we don't uh, take that part of the scripture. We don't talk about confessing our faults to one another because we, we don't want people to know what's going on in our lives. And oftentimes we isolate ourselves um, and not um, allow ourselves to um, become a yoke together with one with like-minded believers. Now understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you should go and spill your beans to everybody in the world because everybody can't handle what the Lord is taking you through. Uh, everybody's prayer life is not up to, 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 to the um, inspection rate that it needs to be uh, for them to handle your circumstance and your situation. However, uh, it's important for us to know that we're not in this battle alone. And so we must gird ourselves or yoke ourselves together with like-minded believers so that we can help pull each other along. If we're there by ourselves, we don't have anyone that we can reach out to that can speak encouraging words unto each other. And the Bible says God, he can speak to us, but he works through other believers to encourage each other. And that's why he said that the strong should bear the infirmities of the weak. And so those that are strong should endeavor to encourage those um, that are with us. And so James told the people in his epistle that they must confess their faults to one another, to pray for one another so that we can be healed. But the point, the scripture, this part of the scripture that we mostly grab onto, it talks about the effectual and fervent prayer of a, of a righteous man. It availeth much. And so he told us that we should pray for one another because effectual and fervent prayers of righteous people, it availeth much. It comes to pass. But for some reason at this moment in history here at the door with Peter and Rhoda, the early believers found themselves gathered together in one place, praying for God to make a way for Peter to escape out of prison. But they did not really believe that God could really do it. For the scripture declares right there that Peter was at the door while they were praying. But when Rhoda came back from the door to tell them that Peter was at the door, they didn't really know, they didn't really believe that Peter was actually at the door. And so what I want you to take note is that the worst thing that we can do as believers is to actually not believe God can do what he said he can do and what he said that he will do. Because it's our faith uh, that empowers God to do great things in our lives. Hebrews 12 and Hebrews 11 and 6 says, uh, uh, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It's not enough to say that I believe God, but we actually must put our faith into action. And so Paul later declared in Ephesians 3 and 20, where he says, Now unto him that is able.
able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think, but it's according to the power that works in us. Amen. Faith is the catalyst that activates the power of God in our lives. It allows the power of God to work in our lives, supernatural things that will blow our mind. But again, we must put our faith into action. It's not enough to say, I believe God and not be willing to take the step because it's the steps of a good man that are ordered by the Lord. And so you must be in some type of progress or some type of movement to trust God. The Bible calls for us not to just be hearers of the words, but actually to be doers of the word as well. Our faith must be moving. It must be something that's alive. It must be something that's in progress for us to activate the supernatural, wonder-working power that God allows to dwell within us. It's amazing to note that the power is in us. The power to walk right, it's already in us. It just needs to be activated. The power to move mountains. He said in the word of God that if you just have faith the size of a mustard seed. Yeah. Now, if you think of a mustard seed, I didn't bring any mustard seeds in here, but mustard seeds are quite small. And if you just have a little faith, you have enough faith to move mountains, to do supernatural things. And so it's already working in us. We just have to activate that faith. And so as I thought about activator. I went back to my younger days and I see some kind of uh, some people here that, that may know what I'm talking about, but is there anybody in the house that used to have a Jerry Carroll back in the days? Is, is there any? Oh, I see I saw a hand creep up and I saw some smiles and I see people scratching, but there's nothing wrong with um, having Jerry Curls back in the day because uh, uh, in those that had them, we understood the power and the anointing of activator. We understood the importance of having activator. But without the juice of the activator spray, um, our hairstyles were, were, would become quite brittle. It would become quite dry. And when it's dry, it didn't have the look and effects that you wanted it to have. And so it didn't display uh, the necessary image that you wanted if your curl was not juicified or, 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 or wet as much as you wanted it to be. But we understood that the activator was important. And so it became our best friend. We made sure we kept some activator with us. For those that carry purses, you may have had a little spray bottle in your, in your purse to make sure you had enough to allow your soul glow to glow. You wanted to make sure you had what you needed on there. And so uh, it's the same with faith. If you don't have, if you don't have, if our faith isn't effective, that means that our walk as Christian is ineffective. Our ministries are ineffective. Yeah. Our calling is ineffective. Our homes are ineffective because faith is what activates the anointing of God in our lives. And so we must understand that faith without works is dead. It's not enough to say, I believe God, but you must put your faith to work today. And so, and so it's many examples in the Bible of people who actually allowed their faith to activate um, the greatness of God in their lives. I'm reminded of the woman with the issue of blood. She had an issue of blood for 12 long years. And her faith is what activated the power of God yeah. in her life. She was afflicted with an issue of blood and nothing seemed to do, nothing seemed to work out for her good. She went to the doctors yeah. and the doctors did not necessarily have the answer. They didn't have the anointing enough to activate the power of God in this woman's life to yeah. create the healing or the supernatural wonder working healing that can be found in the blood of the lamb. And so they didn't have it and for some reason she spent all so that means that money was not the solution to satisfy, to satisfy or to cure her sickness or her disease. But one day she decided that enough was enough and she could no longer keep going to those that did not have the activating power of the blood working within them. And so some of us, we find ourselves too reliant upon our own might. We find ourselves reliant upon our own strength. We find ourselves reliant upon our finances, not understanding that those things are going to pass away. And we wonder why those things are not working out for yeah. our good. We're wondering why we're doing supposedly all that we can. But when you're not doing what God has called for you to do to get the relief or to get the deliverance or to go where he's told you to go, then those things will not work out for your good. And so the scripture I'm reminded right now is that there's a way that seemeth right unto man. And so for some reason it seems right for her to go to the doctors because the doctors practice medicine.
medicine. That was their job to practice medicine. She had money upon money because it said that she spent all that she could to get her solution and to get her breakthrough. But the scripture says there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but for some reason the end thereof are the ways of destruction. And so as she continued to labor uh, with this affliction in the blood, she realized that the way that she chose was not the right way and the way that she needed to get to was to be able to get to Jesus. And so if our ways don't align with God's ways, or God's way, we're heading in the wrong direction. We'll go through praying and we'll understand and don't understand why we have to deal with heartache. We must try Jesus first because Jesus did say, I am the way. Yes. He says, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so we must understand that it's through Jesus. He is the way and he is the door to whatever it is that we need in life. He is the way. And so I have another testimony here of someone who understood that his way was not the right way and he wanted to choose the way uh, of God or choose the way of holiness uh, to get what he needed from God. And so there was a certain centurion um, that activated the power of God in his servant's life. It's amazing that um, his, his uh, belief or his faith was not for his own uh, gratification. It wasn't for his own uh, 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 healing or his own uh, uh, self-medication uh, uh, or whatever it is. It, it wasn't for him. He was interceding on behalf of someone else. And so this certain centurion was having a conversation with Jesus. And for some reason this, under, this, uh, uh, this centurion he understood who Jesus was and understood that Jesus was the person that he needed to help um, his servant in this situation. Um, the servant was someone like uh, E.F. Hutton. For those that remember the, Kirk, the, uh, the commercial uh, when uh, E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens. That's what they told us in the commercial uh, back in the day. And so when the centurion understood, he said, I'm a man of authority, Jesus. And when I speak to people, they do as I command. Yes. And so I understand that you are also a man of authority. And so when you speak, I understand that people in situations and circumstances, they must listen to you. And so it's amazing how this man did not proclaim to be a child of God. He didn't complain, proclaim to be a believer of God, but he understood who Jesus was. Yes. And we must know as believer, believers who Jesus is. And if we don't know who Jesus is, how is it that we can go out and tell the world who Jesus is? We must first allow Jesus to work his work in us so that he can work out things that are in us that are unlike him so he can do the supernatural wonder working thing that he has in store for us today. And I often say and I say here today that we come to service after service and for some reason we still don't know who Jesus is. And since we don't really know him, we have not experienced the great anointing that comes with knowing just who Jesus is. I heard back in the day, we all you, uh, me often used to say, everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Amen. He's a rock in a weary land. Does anybody know him as a rock in a weary land? And the songwriter says, when I was sick, the Lord healed me. He is a, a shelter in the time of storm. Uh, when I was about to lose my mind, he kept me in perfect right. peace because my mind was stayed on him. He is the wheel in the middle of a wheel. Yes. And so the centurion understand and told Jesus, God, just you are such an awesome God and you're such a magnificent king. You don't have to go um, to get to my servant. If you can only just speak the word. How great is the word of God that I, all I had to do is speak the word. The Bible tells us that there is power of life and death in the tongues of the believers. And so we can speak those things that are not as though they were. That's all we have to do is speak. And so when we know Jesus, we know real power. But when we don't know Jesus intimately, we don't understand the power that we have in the Son of God today. And so in our scripture today, we find the church in a state of transition. In Acts chapter 12, we find that Saul had, or at least in Acts chapter, prior to this chapter, we find that Saul uh, was converted on the road of Damascus. And after Saul's conversion, it appeared that the church was going to have an easy or smooth transition or smooth road uh, to do what God had called him to do. He told them uh, in Matthew 28 to go ye therefore and teach all nations. He told them to go so that there'll be witnesses in uh, Judea, in Samaria, and, uh, and, and, and into the uttermost parts of the world. But for some reason, they found themselves caught up and stuck in Jerusalem. I, I, we can't. 
We can't bring folks into this place by going from church to church. That's not what we're supposed to do to bring people in from the yeah. fields of sin. But what we have to do is go where they are. Yeah. We don't have to go where they are and commit ourselves or to conform to what they're doing, but we have to go where they are at so that we can compel them to come in and let them know that Jesus still saves. And so they found themselves stuck in Jerusalem because it was Saul who was uh, doggedly pursuing them. It was Saul who was persecuting the saints of the early church and it was all under the authority of the high priest. Uh, but after Saul uh, was converted and transformed on the road to the Damascus it appeared that uh, the saints were going to have an easy road. But after his uh, uh, a conversion, uh, the high priest Gamaliel, he said, told them, you all need to leave those people alone. Stop harassing them people because uh, if uh, their new religion is something real, then it's going to last whether you persecute them or not. And if it's not real, then it's going to fade away. And so, for, and so we know in the Bible that the Christianity, or at least the church, early church, uh, began to grow. And they began to grow. And so uh, the persecution was not able to quench the fire that was brewing within them. And so it was not going to die, but for some reason, uh, immediately after uh, Paul's or Saul's conversion, uh, another storm began to brew uh, because civil authorities decided that they were going to uh, begin to persecute the saints. And it comes to mind to let us know that once we get over one circumstance or we get over one trial, there's another trial waiting um, on, the, uh, on the horizon. And we have to be prepared to understand that another situation is going to come. Um, Lady McCown in her earlier coffee breaks understood, told us uh, uh, that in our current situation, God is already preparing us for the next situation. And so what we need to do is understand it and prepare ourselves that in our trials and our tribulations, that God is working out something in us to help us to grow and to prepare us for the next stage in life. How God can be such an awesome God and not prepare us and not equip us for every obstacle that's coming our way. That's why he tells us that all our ways to acknowledge him and if we acknowledge him, he will direct our pathways. And so in our scripture today, um, the, the people of God, they began, uh, they came under a new attack and it came from Herod the king at the time. And so Herod the king decided that he was going to vex the church. And it's often it's amazing how uh, the devil, he likes to pick on uh, little people. And as he gets confidence beating up on little people, then he comes to the bigger fish. He don't, he don't want to go and fight the big fish first. He wants to go and, and pick on the little people because it's the big people. It's those that are strong that should bear the infirmities of the weak. And so he catches our attention when he messes with um, our children. And that's just how God is. When, when God sees that somebody is messing with his child, he, he don't take it for granted how high you are or your title. He just knows that he wants to protect you and he wants to uh, keep you. And so Herod decided that uh, he was going to vex the church and, and he found himself to... Uh, to kill James, the brother of John. Now, James was one of those, uh, the sons of Zebedee. He was one of the sons of thunder. He was one of the ones whose mom came to Jesus and said, Jesus, won't you let my son sit, uh, one sit on the right side and one sit on your left side. I, I want my sons to be up with you in glory. And he had to tell them, your mother don't understand what she's asking for. And they said, well, we understand, God. We want to sit on uh, the right side and the left side of you. He said, yes, you won't be able to sit there because God is the only one who can dictate who sits where in heaven, but I'm going to let you know you one day you're going to have to walk in my shoes. One day you're going to have to walk in the shoes that I walk in. Persecution is coming your way. And so in verse 2 in Acts chapter 12, it just so happens that Jesus was correct in his foretelling, in his prophesying. And it's amazing to know that everything that Jesus says must come to pass. And what God says and has spoken in your life, it's a guarantee that it must come to pass in your life. And so James was slain by the sword. And, and the devil, just as he does when he is able to afflict someone, he gets a little bit bolder. And so he decided that he was going to go for a bigger fish. Now, understand that on the day of Pentecost, it was Peter who was the one who was bold enough to stand before the people of uh, the people of the Jews at that time and began to declare the good news of Jesus. He told them, these people are not as drunk as you yeah. said. But this is what the prophet Joel, Joel said, yeah. that in the last days I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It was Peter, the boisterous one, the one who was not willing, the one who was not willing to take a back seat to anyone was the one that was stepping up and this is the one that uh, uh, Herod decided that he was going to attack next and so he was able to catch up with Herod, uh, uh, Herod was able to catch up with him in verse 3 of Acts chapter 12 and at the end of Acts chapter 12 it talks about it was the day of 11 
bread. And so for some reason, here it appears, um, he understood the laws of the Jews. He understood that this was supposed to be a time of celebration. And we have to wonder what was going on in the Jews' mind that during a time of celebration, they were actually persecuting people who were celebrating their freedom. The, um, the days of unleavened bread was the days that they celebrate the Passover. They celebrated G uh, God making a way for them to be able to escape out of yes. Egypt, not just broke, busted, and disgusted, but he allowed them to escape with riches upon riches. So when they entered into their promised land, they had everything that they needed and more. And so he wanted to apprehend Peter and, and put him into prison. And it's just like the devil. He always does things um, overboard. He thinks that if he adds and piles on and piles on, that God is not able to make a way of escape. But I'm here to tell you today that no matter how bleak your situation may be, no matter matter how troublesome your situation may look. It may look like the devil is piling upon you, but he's just causing himself to get a bigger defeat because God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think. So no matter how bleak the situation may look, it just means that you're going to have a greater breakthrough. If you know that you're going to have a greater breakthrough, isn't it worth the trials? Isn't it worth the tribulation? Isn't it worth the situation that you go through if God is going to get the glory out of this. Amen. And so in verse 4, he put 16 soldiers to wrap around him and they kept him bound in chains every single day and every single night. They didn't allow him to do anything. And so the enemy thinks that he can just lock you down and he can put you under subjection. But the Bible says they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength that we can call upon the name of Jesus and he'll answer us and show us great and mighty things. And so the Bible tells us that the people of God in verse 5 it says while Peter was kept in prison well, the people were praying amen. without ceasing and so that reminds me that the people of God should be praying it shouldn't just be the pastor taking time to pray it shouldn't just be the first lady taking time to pray but it says the people of God continue without ceasing in the church praying for amen. Peter's deliverance and so it's amazing that they had a situation at the door the people of God on the inside of the door were praying but the deliverance was on the outside of the door. What you talking about, brother preacher? What? But the, the, the people inside were praying, but their deliverance on the outside of the door, that's just reminding me that what God has in store for us is for us to be able to take it outside the door. The door shouldn't be the stop or the, or the hindrance from allowing us to get the word of God out and see what God can do in the lives of other people. But for some reason, the early church here in this, in this scripture, they had a block at the door. And so I had to do a little research. What, what, what is a door? What is the door? Because Rhoda came to the door to open up the door because anytime somebody knocks at the door, you assume that they should open up the door. When you got somebody ringing on the doorbell, you just don't let the doorbell ring unless you know it's somebody that you don't want at the door. And I've had that occasion where I didn't want to talk to somebody at the door, and so I just let the doorbell ring. But they were praying. They were looking for something. They wanted something from God. And when you're looking in anticipation from something from God, when it knocks at the door, how dare you ignore the salvation that God has brought to you at your door when you've been waiting for a package at the door. We found ourselves here, Lady McCown and I, we found ourselves here uh, waiting for some, a package on Friday. And we waited and we waited for the package here on Friday. And, 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 and before we got tired of waiting, we waited a little more and the package finally came. It would have been a waste of a day for us to come up here to, to work, to wait for a package and not receive the package when it came at the appointed place and the appointed time. And so often we're too rushy, we're too quick to move from where God has us at. And then when the, the, where we're at is where our deliverance is at. Where God has us at is where our freedom is at. Where we're at at that point in time is where God wants to relieve us from the cares of the world that has us burdened because we're waiting and we're petitioning on God. But how is it that we can pray and not expect God to come through with the to answering our prayer? They prayed. Uh, they prayed. They were praying without ceasing in the room for God to make a way for Peter to escape. But for 
for some reason they were at the door. And so I'm here to remind you today, why pray if you don't understand that God already has your blessings at the door? Why ask God? Why call upon him? Understand that he's going to answer you and show up in a great and mighty way if you don't believe God can answer the prayer and come to your rescue just in time, just in the nick of time. An old saints of old would say he may not come when you want him, but he'll always be there right on time. And so in spite of what was going on in our lives, we must trust God and know that our answer is at the door. If we're willing to pray, our solution and our salvation is at the door today. If we're willing to seek God's face and we're willing to turn our plates away and take time to fast and pray, I'm here to remind you today that your deliverance is at the door today. And no matter what the situation may be, they found themselves praying for Peter's deliverance, but when they heard that Peter was at the door, they said, no, not so. It cannot be possible. And sometimes we have solutions. We have the answer to our problems right in front of us. The deliverance is right in front of us looking at us in our face and we say no, that's not it because it may not be coming from the person that we want it to come from. It may not be coming the way that we wanted it to come. We may be looking over here and the deliverance is over here. We must know that God is able to do it. He's going to do it and so we cannot fret today that God is able to do just what he says to do and more. They marked it at the entrance. The door was the entrance. And the door to our lives is at the entrance. Revelation 3 and 20 says, Behold, God says, Behold, I'm at the door knocking. And what he's doing, he said, I'm at the door. If you allow me to come in, I'll come in. And not only would I come in, he said, but I'll come in and suck with you. He said, I'll come in and rest with you. I'll come in and abide with you. If you're, if you're willing to allow me to come into your lifestyle, if you're willing to allow me to come in and see all of your hangups, God says, I want to come in to the door. So salvation is at the door. That's all you have to do is be willing to open up the door and allow salvation to come in today. What situations do you have? in your life that you need to welcome God into in your life. He's not a respecter of person. He'll come into your situation no matter how dirty your room is, no matter how dirty your home is, no matter how messed up things are going in your life today. God is willing to come in and it's awesome to know that when God comes in, he'll start cleaning up for you. He'll start picking up the trash. He'll start uprooting things that are unlike him because he's not a person that's going to abide with things that are filthy. He just wants to come in. So is the Lord knocking at your door today? Do you need a way of escape? Do you need a door open? Do you need a way to be made that you can understand that has not been able to be made because you didn't invite God into your situation today? What is it that you have in your life today? What's going on into your life today that you need God to come in today to make a way? Is there anything that you need God to do? Is there anything too hard for God? He told Abraham there's nothing there's nothing too hard for me. And if there's nothing too hard to God, how dare we not know who God is? Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. And not only should we know who Jesus is, we ought to know how good and how great he is. Ask yourself today, is there anything too hard for God? Has God ever failed you in your life today? Is there anything you can look back and say, God didn't make a way and when I didn't think that he could make a way? Is there, is there anything that God has come up, has come up short in your life today? I dare to say today that the answer is a, an effectual or emphatic no. There's nothing that God has ever done that has failed us and has fallen short. And so I'm coming here to quickly to a close. I've, I've ran out of gas and I've given you all that I can give you today. I'm here to remind you today that your salvation, your solution is at the door. Amen. What is it that God has at the door that you need? What salvation God has at the door that you need today? I'm here to remind you it's at the door. If you're praying, and men ought to always pray and they're not faint. And so if your salvation is at the is not at the door today, that means that you must continue to pray. He says, some things or these things come by fasting and praying. And so they were in the temple fasting and praying. And it even says here that in verse 16, it says, when they came, finally came to the door and saw their solution or their salvation there, they saw Peter at the door, they saw the answer to their prayers at the door. They were astonished. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that God actually answered their prayers today. We have the word of God today that we don't have to ridicule and make God look like he's not who he is. If we pray and believe God can, and we pray and we believe that God will, then we should walk in faith knowing that God is able to do just what we, he said.
said that he would do. The scripture says, and I don't have it written down here, it says when we pray, we can pray confidently knowing that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we can have confidence to know that he's able to do just what he says that he can do, that we're, he's going to be able to do what we pray for him to be able to do. Amen. So don't pray if you don't believe God. Amen. Because God is in his power, his anointing, his, his, his supernatural working is activated in our lives through faith and through prayer today. Rest on your feet today. Rest on your feet today. I'm not sure if that came out the way that it needed to be received today. But I know God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He's a rewarder. And so when the word of God comes forth, it's our job to grab the word and take hold of the word and place it into a place where it can be used for God to get the glory out of us. Every hand is bowed and every eye is closed. Revelations 3 and 20. I said this before, but I said it out of my memory and I didn't give it the, the just deserves that it needed. Revelations 3 and 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Our scripture today had Peter knocking at the door. He had already, God had already made the way of escape. He heard the cries of his people. He heard the beckoning of his people calling on the name of Peter. God, make a way for Peter to escape. Uh, uh, Herod, he just slayed uh, James and we don't want uh, him to slay Peter. Lord, make a way out of no way and allow Peter to come out of prison. And lo and behold, as the people of God prayed, God began to do the work. The scripture tells us in Acts 12 that as the people prayed, God sent the angel into the inner prison where Peter was. He didn't even, the angel did not even wake up uh, the, 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 the 16 soldiers that were next to him. And that reminds me that it doesn't matter what it looks like around you. It doesn't matter what's going on around you today. God is able to take you up out of the ugly situation that may be surrounding you. And he's able to take you to a wealthy place, a place of freedom. That's all Peter had to do is stand up. He told Peter, rise. Rise up out of the bondage. Rise up out of the change and follow me. And every step that Peter took, it said that the gates began to open. He, he opened up the inner gates. He didn't have to touch. He didn't have to do anything. But the power of prayer was it began to do the work that God needed to do in Peter's life. He began, the angel opened up the doors and made a way. And made a way for him to work his way back to the house where the people of God were at. Where they were praying. And he knocked. And so here God is right now in the midst of this service. He's knocking on the door. He's knocking on the door of your hearts. And he's looking for you to answer the door. He says, behold, I stand at the door. And here I am. I, I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm right here before you, ready to give you whatever it is that you may need and more. I stand at the door and I'm willing to come in. It doesn't matter what's going on inside of you right now, but I'm more than able to do great things in your life. I has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it appeared unto me what good things God has in store for you on this day. So God is saying to you, people of God that are in the house of the Lord right now, behold, I stand at the door. What is it that you need me to do? What is it you need me to break through for you? What is it? What chains do I need to tear down in your life today? What doors do I need to open in your life today? What it is, whatever it is, I want you to, as your eyes are closed right now, I want you to make your petitions made known unto God. Let him know what it is. He's at the door. And he said, just open the door. Open the door of your heart right now. Open the door and say, God, here it is. Here is the situation. Here is the circumstance. Here is the problem. Here is what's going on in my life. God, I need you to make a way. God, I need you to open up the door. God, I need you to make the crooked way straight. What is it that you need God to do in your life right now? Make your petition made known to him. 
the harvest, the, the ground is already, is already ready. The harvest is already, I mean, the ground has already been tilled. That's all he's ready to do is just come in and he's ready to plant himself in the situation in your life right now. Let God know what it is. God, I need more strength today. God, I need healing in my body. God, I need my child to be saved. God, I need you to blow a breakthrough in my home. God, I need you to work a miracle on my job. God, I need you to help me to get a job. What is it that you need from God today? And as the musicians continue to play softly, make your petitions known. We're in a season of prayer right now. We're in a season of prayer right now in the midst of this service. Let God know. That's all you got to do is make your petitions made known unto him. He says, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which you know it's not just, just let it be known. Let me know what it is that you need me to do and I'm willing to come in. I'm willing to sup and I'm willing to open up the door and make the way straight for you on this day. And so Father, here we are standing in desperate need of you. Behold, you're at the door, God, and we want you to come on in and sup with us on this day. God, there's situations and circumstances that are evolving around in our lives and we can't handle them on our own. God, we welcome you into our lives. We welcome you into our hearts on this day. In the mighty name of Jesus, come in, God, and have your way, God. Come in and rest in me, God. Come in and abide in me, oh God, and come in and have your way. Work the miracle in our lives, oh God. Help us to stand, oh God. Help us to stand there for God, having our loins girt about with the truth, oh God. Having all the breastplate of righteousness and, and our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, God. You have and giving us everything that we need, God. So come on in and sup with us today. Activate the power that works within us, oh God. Activate the faith that we need for the supernatural, wonder-working power to be made manifest in our lives. God, we declare this miracle signs and wonders, oh God. We want them to be performed in our midst, God. You have given us the authority, oh God, to speak with power under your anointing. And so we speak now over our loved ones, God, today. We speak anointing, oh God, over them. We speak power, oh God, anointing, oh God, on them right now. We speak healing in the lives of our loved ones. Those, there are many sick and afflicted among us, oh God. We speak healing right now in the name of Jesus. It's not by our power. It's not by our might, but it's by thy spirit, God. Work the work, oh God, in the name of Jesus, God. These early church Christians, God, they didn't have to do the work, God, but that's all they did was pray. And so here we are praying right now, yielding to your will and yielding to your way. God, let not our will be done, but God, let us make our petitions made known unto you so that you can come in and answer our pleas and answer our call. And God, if you do this, God, we'll give your name glory and honor and praise. We thank you in advance for what our eye has not seen, neither has our ears heard, neither has it appeared unto men what good things you have in store for us. Behold, we knock at the door, and we welcome you into our lives on this day. In Jesus' name, we pray this day. Amen and amen. As your hands are still bowed, if there's any among us today, that don't know Jesus as your in a pardon of your sins. I'm here to declare today that behold, Jesus is knocking at the door right now for you. He's knocking at the door to let you know that you're not in this race alone. That if you're willing to allow him to come in, he's willing to come in and to come save you. He's willing to come in and set you free. He's willing to come in to heal you from the bonds of sins so that you can walk worthy of the vocation wherewith he has called you. He has called you to be a joint heir, but you must receive him and confess him as your personal Lord and Savior. And so if there's any in among us in the house of the Lord today that don't know Jesus in the pardon of their sins, I welcome you to the order to receive what God has in store for you today. God, he, Jesus is still a way maker. He is still a strong tower and a deliverer. He is still a saver, a bridger of the gap, the device that's set between us and between God. He is still that person that can come in and save, heal, deliver, and set the captives free. He still can wash away every crimson stain today. And so if you don't know him in the pardon of your sins, he's at the door waiting for you today. And so if there's any among us that need to touch and agree that God can work a miracle in your life today, I welcome you to the altar that we can touch and agree that God can do what you need him to do in your life. 
Is there anything too hard for God? I'm here to remind you and to declare today that there is nothing too hard for God today. There's nothing he's unable to take care of. There's nothing he's unable to fix. There's nothing he's unable to handle. And so if you're willing to cast your cares upon him, he's willing to take that burden and you can leave it there with him today. He's, he's here. He's willing. He's willing to do it today. And so that's all you have to do is believe God and trust God that he can do it in the name of Jesus. I am here to declare that it's not by power, nor is it by might, but it's by his spirit, said the Lord. 